Amen. Great singing orchestra. Thank you for that. You can be dismissed this morning. Let's take our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you will. I appreciate those who sing and play in our church. They're a blessing. It adds a lot, doesn't it? Imagine showing up on a Sunday and there's no instruments. We just have to listen to each other. Oh, appreciate that. You know, David, he was a mighty man in the Bible, wasn't he? And yet David was a musician. And uh, he made a whole bunch of musical instruments and he orchestrated uh, song and singers in the house of God. He was quite a musical guy, played the harp himself. So singing is a big part of the Christian life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Paul is writing here about some things that we know. As believers, there are some things that we know that are going to happen. And because of those things, then there are other things that that should produce in our life. Because you know that this will happen, then it should produce other things. And he just makes an assumption as he writes here. Just an assumption that because of this, then... I will be this way. And yet sometimes I find when I read the Bible, I don't necessarily have the same assumption Paul had. And I need to go back and realign myself with the assumptions that God makes about my life. Now, I want you to notice with me what he said in verse number one. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now he's simply saying, I know this. I know that if my body dies, this earthly house, if it were dissolved, that there's a building of God. It's a house that, that nobody fashioned with their hands. It's an eternal house in the heavens and it's waiting. And Paul just doesn't use himself here. He didn't say, I know this. You notice he says, we know this. As believers, here's what we know. We know that on the other side of this life is life. We groan in this earthly body. I look around and I see the, the lives of so many of you and I know that you groan in this frame. It doesn't work right. It, it creaks and groans and cracks in the wind and falls out of bed and falls down the stairs and all the problems with this body. We try awfully hard to keep this thing fresh, don't we? We do all that we can to pamper it, but it's going to dissolve one day. We know it. Yeah, we know it. And so he says we groan. And why do we groan? We earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. There's this earnest desire that I will be with my Savior, and not only the glory and wonder of my eternal home, but the fact that this earthly frame, which is so frail, is going to be changed one day. Verse number four, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. I don't just want to die, I want to go home. It's not that I'm looking to escape the pain and trial and hurt and heartache of this life. I just want to die and have it over with. That never ought to be the desire or the journey of the child of God. I groan so that I could be clothed upon, he said. That mortality, verse 4, might be swallowed up of life. This mortality, swallowed up of life. Now, he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God. Did you know that God fashioned you to feel this way? God has wrought you. That word wrought is a, a craftsman who uses the tools of their trade to, to make something. A, a, a craftsman in iron will, will make something out of it. and he, he makes a good work. God says, I'm looking at your life and I've wrought you, I've fashioned you, I've crafted you for this very thing that you would feel like in this life. I don't fit here. I don't belong here. I don't want to stay here. There's something eternal waiting for me. I just can't wait to go home. God said, I have wrought you for that very thing. 
But he's also given us, in verse 5, the earnest of the Spirit. Now, you know, in Ephesians 4, he talks about this very thing. We have the earnest or the pledge or the down payment, the promise of God called his Spirit who indwells us. It's God's promise that this mortality will be swallowed up of life. Therefore, he said, we're always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. He said, we're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. What's your will today? Is your will that you would live a long and prosperous and happy life? Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. I think all of us want to make sure that if at all possible, our life prospers and that we have our health and that we're happy in this life. It, there is nothing better, Solomon said, that, that a man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor under the sun. It's the gift of God. We know that that's a good thing to strive for, but it's not everything. It's just a temporal thing. And so he says, we're confident but willing rather to be absent from the body so that we can be and, and to be present with the Lord, verse 8. I just, I just want to go home. But I look around the room this Sunday morning and I see so many fi- faces that are bright and smiling and alive. You're here. Uh, you're not in heaven at the moment. You're here looking at me and you've got a Bible opened and you're saying, okay, well, what's the point? And what's the purpose? Verse 9, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, this was all introduction to the thought this morning, but Paul is just making some assumptions. He says, I know that this body is going to die one day, and it's okay. Because I've got something waiting for me in heaven on the other side, and I'm groaning for that, and I, I long for that. And I would rather be there. But I know this, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. And so I'm not there yet. And I realize there's something I'm doing here. And I've got to prepare for the other side right here. Because I know that I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ and give account for my life at the judgment seat of Christ. And so I must labor. And so I must work. And so he said in verse number 12, he says, We as apostles, we as ministers, we commend not ourselves again unto you, but we give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. Because there were some that were accusing Paul Some were saying of Paul, well, he's not really an apostle and he's not really sent from God and Paul's just in it for himself. And Paul was simply saying, well, that's not the truth at all. So he said in verse number 13, if we're beside ourselves, it's to God. If we're sober, it's for your cause. There were people that were basically saying to Paul, you're a crazy man. They were saying about Paul, oh, he's out of his mind. You might remember at the end of the book of Acts, Paul stands before Festus and Agrippa and is preaching the truth of the gospel of Christ. And remember what Festus said, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. You're you're crazy, Paul. And even earlier in Paul's life, it was being said about Paul the same way. He's just crazy. So Paul says to the church, if I'm crazy, it's to God. If I'm serious about life, it's to God. My life is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because here's what we judge in verse 14, that if one died for all, then all were dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now that is the marching order for every child of God in his church. This is the purpose of your life. You sit here this Sunday morning and you've got trials in your life. You've got uncertainties that you're faced with. You've got things that have been reversals. And you say, well, I just don't like how this has played out in my life. And I'm just unhappy with this circumstance of my life. And I feel like getting discouraged. And I feel like being depressed. And I feel like hurting myself. And I've got all these problems in life. And guys, we all have problems in life. But you need to understand what he said here. That if he died for you, then you live because you've, been, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. But from henceforth, from today forward, you need to understand that you don't live to yourself, but unto him that died for you and rose again. The purpose of your life is for Jesus Christ. The purpose of your life is to fulfill the will of God for your life. Wherefore, verse 16, henceforth, from now forward, we know no man after the flesh. Yea, yea though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet, yet now henceforth we know him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hey, there's something new in your life. You're a new creature. Old things are passed away. And what a wonderful verse. All things are become new. 
And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And here's what it is. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, and then I'll start preaching. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Father, help us as we study the scriptures to know what it is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ in this life. Thank you that you gave your life for us. What an exchange. Thank you that you now just give us the privilege of giving, living our life for you. Help us to live it in a manner that is well-pleasing to you. And we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The Bible tells us that we're, we're a new man if we're saved. In verse number 17, this uh, is such a wonderful verse. Many of us know this. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You need to understand that if you're going to be an ambassador, a representation of Jesus Christ, a representative of God, then you're going to have to be a new man. Because a spiritual ambassador is a saved man. Here's what that means. That means he has repented of and put his faith in Jesus Christ only. A spiritual ambassador for Christ is a new man. I wonder, are you a new man here today? And you understand the word man here is just speaking of man or woman. Are you a new man? Uh, God never said you had to be a new man, uh, but church attendance is what makes it. Uh, religious devotion is what makes it. Good intentions are what make it. Those things make you a good person, a moral person in your own eyes, but they don't make you a new man. And if you're going to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you're going to have to be a new man, which means you're going to have to repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And when a man does that and he gets saved, he's wonderfully born again. That woman at the well in John in chapter 4 listens to Jesus talk about himself. I'm the water of life. Hey, if you come and you drink, you'll never drink again if you drink the water I'm giving you. And so she goes and and she tells the people of the city, do you remember the story? And then they come out and they question Jesus and they hear Jesus and they say, oh, now we believe. Hey, it's not just because of what you've told us, but we've heard it from him. And now we believe and they were wonderfully born again and they were wonderfully changed and they were made into new creatures, new men. And this is the marvel of salvation that God could take corruption and sin and wickedness and brokenness and he can make it new. That's what he does. It's the marvel of the Christian life. And when you get saved, you're in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You don't add Jesus to your life. You become in Christ when you're born again. Jesus isn't just another idol or God that's put on the shelf of your life alongside of your own self. The other things that you worship and your money and your success and your career and your religion. Oh no, Jesus Christ is God who died for you and you must be in Christ and you get there when you're born again. And it's the life of God within that changes a man from darkness to light. He's a new creation. It's not reformation, right? You're not reforming something that's broken. It's transformation. Something is all new. He is a new creature. How often have you spoken to somebody about Christ? And they just feel like, well, I need to change this or I'm not good enough to get saved. I need to stop doing this before God will save me from my sin. And he said, no, it's, God is not interested in reforming the brokenness of your life, the sin of your life. He wants to make you new. When you get saved, then everything becomes new and all of that drops away. You have to get saved first. He's a new man. And what happens with the new man? Well, the new man has new desires. I find it interesting that there are people who claim to be born again. Maybe somebody in the room today, I don't know, claims to be born again and they say, well, I'm a Christian and I go to church. But I find it interesting that when somebody says that they're born again, but their desires have never changed. What they were before they got saved is exactly what they are after they get saved. Their desires have not changed. They act the same way, think the same way, want the same things. They are the same way. Nothing has fundamentally changed in their life. But yet the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And old things are passed away. 
You see, when you get saved, all things have become new. And the desires you had before you got saved are different than who you are now that you're a Christian. One of the proof, the greatest proofs of somebody who's genuinely converted is that they start caring about the lost around them. Now, you don't care about unsaved people when you're unsaved. You're just one of the crowd. But it's amazing, upon the point of somebody's conversion, one of the very first things that you see is they start thinking about people that they know, particularly their closest family and friends, and they want them to hear the message they just got. I need to tell my dad. I need to tell my sister. I need to tell my auntie. I can't wait for this person to hear this truth. They just desire to tell the lost about Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10. He says, give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Paul said, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they might be saved. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 33. The profit of many that they might be saved. Paul is looking at his life and he's saying, my, my whole focus and desire is that the lost would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. You see, the desire of a new man is the salvation of the lost. Why don't you evaluate, could we all just evaluate our life this last seven days? How much of a concern did we have for the lost around us? How much time was spent in, in prayer or consideration or evangelism or regard for lost people that we came in contact with? Do we have the desire of the new man that the lost would be saved? that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I suddenly care for the unsaved around me when I'm a new man. But Paul said in this very chapter, in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, he said in verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. I, I'm making a judgment because here's my judgment that if one, Jesus Christ, died for all, then everybody, all, were dead. Now, here's what he's saying. Now that I'm a new man, I have a new motive. And my motive is this. My motive is the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constrains me. I can't help but be different. I can't help but care for the lost because I'm moved and motivated by love for Jesus Christ. It's love for Jesus that motivates my actions. It's love for Jesus Christ. It's not a love of myself. It's not a love of the world around me. I don't care about the world around me. I care about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so loving him is what motivates me. Sometimes we, we go through these ups and downs in our Christian life where we just seem to be really zealous for a while and then that falls off and we don't care and we just have these peaks and valleys. And the reason that we drop off is because I think we've stopped loving the Lord supremely. We care less about him than we do other things. But if we truly love the Lord the right way, we're gonna care about the things that the Lord cares about. And that's why Paul is bringing this whole chapter down to this one verse in verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors. Because of the fact we know that we, we will have a home in heaven one day, but we're not there yet, and we groan for heaven, but we're not there yet, so we must prepare for heaven and the judgment seat of Christ. Hey, listen, but we're not there yet, so Jesus Christ has committed to us a word. He's given to us a message a message to reconcile the lost world to himself. And he's made us ambassadors of him because he's not here and we represent him in another country. And so as strangers and pilgrims in this life, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But it must be, first of all, that we're a new man. It must be that we have a new vision for the lost. We have a concern for the unsaved. We have a motive, which is a love for Jesus Christ that governs my whole life. An ambassador for Christ is a new man, but that ambassador also has a new ministry because in verse number, number 18, he said, all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. As an ambassador for Christ, he's given you a new ministry. Now, to minister is to serve. I look around the room, and many of you have put your faith in Christ. You've given a testimony of being born again. Then each of us who, who claims to be saved, we are now servants. It's our purpose. Ministers. You know, if you're going to serve the world in this ministry, 
to reconcile men to God. You're going to have to understand the condition of this lost world. You know the world around you is at enmity with God. You know that. Look at John 3 and verse 30, if you'll turn over there with me. John 3 and verse number 30. <clears throat> this is one of the great chapters of the Bible, John chapter 3. And look at the very last verse of this chapter, John chapter 3 and verse number 36. The Father loveth the Son. I'm sorry. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. For every lost man or woman that's on the face of this earth, if they reject the Son of God, they will not see life, but the wrath of God abides. It dwells upon them. You know, we need to understand the condition of this world. They're at enmity with God. And the world around you, they just look at things and they think that they've lived for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. They think humanity has evolved into its current form and men have been around for, for eons and eons and ages past. And they just think, well, all things continue as they were. Nothing's any different now than it ever was in the past. Nothing will be any different in the future than it is right now. We're just here for a short little space and then we die and we go to the dust and it's over, it's gone and they don't realize that they're living this short little space of life under the enmity of God. They are the enemies of God. They're ignorant of their sin and they're ignorant of their standing with God. They're in danger. God said to Jonah, yet 30 days and I'm gonna overthrow Nineveh. So you go to that city and you preach to them so that I can show mercy to them. And after a little bout of disobedience, Jonah finds his way to Nineveh. And his message to Nineveh was repent. The judgment of God is coming, repent. And by and large, the whole city from the greatest to the least of them turned in repentance. But prior to that, they were ignorant of their standing. And the world around you, your friends, the people you work with, they're ignorant of their standing with God. Whether they believe in him or not is not the relevant point. They're ignorant of the fact that they're under the judgment of God. The wrath of God abides upon them. And you and I have a new ministry. These people that we serve, these lost people around us, our ministry is to the world it's not to the borders of nations, it's to the world. This ministry that we have is the aim of foreign missions. This ministry that we have is to get the gospel to the unevangelized nations of this world, to the people who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Not even that they have rejected him, they don't know him. And this ministry that we have is an itinerant work, it's difficult, it's demanding. It's the reason why so many people will not leave the comfort of their life, leave the comfort of their home, leave the safety of their family and their career to go off into this wide world and do this great work. And we face the souls of millions of men and women around this world who are ignorant of the name of Jesus Christ. And here we are this morning confronted with the weight of our responsibility. We have been given a ministry and the commission that we've been given is very clear. I'll read it for you. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. You see, to fulfill this great commission, this ministry that we have, we have to go to the nations that have no access to the gospel. We have to go there. I believe that reaching immigrants here in Australia, it's good, it's necessary, but it is not a full com uh, completion of the Great Commission. It's just a part. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, you understand the uttermost parts of the world. Well, we thank the Lord he's brought some of the uttermost here. We thank the Lord for that. But there's still a whole lot in the uttermost that have never been reached. And nothing can replace the sending forth of laborers into the harvest fields of this world. Nothing can replace it. We have been given a ministry. 
But this will not happen. Sending forth laborers. If the church stays in its home country, playing games while men die. We've been given a new ministry. I wonder how can we justify accepting the privileges of the Christian faith without also embracing the responsibilities we've been given? How do we justify that? I love the privileges of being a Christian, but I don't want the responsibilities and obligations that come with it. We're a new man. We have a new ministry. But God tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that we have a new message. Would you look at verse number 19 with me? The end of verse number 18 actually says that he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And here's what it is. That when you see to wit in your Bible, that means here it is. By way of explanation. To wit, here it is. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Hey, Philip, have you been so long time with me that you don't know me? Philip, if you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. Jesus is God in the flesh. God was in Christ. And the purpose for those few years of his ministry was that he was reconciling the world to himself. Notice it says he was not imputing their trespasses unto them. So the message that we, that we have is at the end of verse number 19. He has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This new message. It's a message of the love of God for fallen man. Hey, brethren, listen. We're going to get up tomorrow, most of us, and we're going to go to work and about our normal business on a Monday. And if nothing in here changes, I promise you nothing out there is going to change. And if we go about our business day to day ignorant or unconcerned about the lost around us, unaware of the message that we've been given and the responsibility we have to get the message to the lost, they are going to continue on in their sin and they're going to die and go to a place called the lake of fire for all of eternity. But we have been given a message of the love of God. And the love of God is that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. God was in Christ, it says. I love what, what John says in 1 John 4. He says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us. Hey, this is the way that the love of God was visibly demonstrated. Here it is. That because God sent his only begotten son into the world. In this was the love of God manifest. It was made visible that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. How is it that God demonstrated his love? He came into this world so that we could have life. And this message we have is a message of the love of God for a fallen world. And the message is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. This is the message. Here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 19, it says that he, was, he would not impute their trespasses unto them. In other words, what he came to do is to bring peace in his relationship to mankind. There was a trespass that we all had. Brethren, God, there was a line in the sand called the law. And God was standing on that side of the line in his perfection and holiness, and he said, this is my standard for righteousness. And every single man has stepped over the line. We have abandoned the truth, forsaken the law of God, gone each of us to our own way. We are all astray as mankind. Therefore, therefore, we are in danger of his judgment. And so because of that fact, he wanted to give peace to us in that relationship that he had with mankind. He didn't want to impute the trespasses of men to them. To impute means to make you accountable for. He's putting it on your account. And you and I have each trespassed. The world out there has trespassed against God. And their sin and the judgment that comes with it is, is imputed to their account. They are guilty. And Jesus Christ said, let me demonstrate my love for you. I don't want you to be guilty of your sin. But brethren, we need to understand as a church today that Jesus Christ is not an ethnic savior. He didn't just come for the few. He didn't just come for some cultures, for one group or a nation. He's not an ethnic savior. He came to reconcile the world. 
Paul said in 1 Timothy in chapter 2, speaking of Jesus, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's the whole world that he wants to hear the gospel of Christ. And there's this heresy out there of this selective salvation as if God predetermined or pre-picked this group or this person or, or this. That's not the way God is at all. That is so contrary to the clear teaching of the word of God. It's also contrary to the spirit of the love of Christ who gave himself for the world. For the love of Christ constraineth, as Paul said in this verse, verse 14, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Hey, he died for you. Do you sit here this morning? Have you forgotten? In the last seven days, has there been a conscious thought in your mind by way of memory that Jesus Christ came into the world and died for you because of your sin? But it wasn't just you. It was every person in every place at every time in this world. The love of Christ, the love of God, he came to bring peace in this relationship with mankind. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. He's not going to hold my sin against me because he loves me. That is the message, by the way, of love. It's called redemption. That Jesus Christ would come to take away and clear the guilt of man's sin. He said in Hebrews in chapter 10, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that good? So we're back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as we close this morning. And Paul said, now we're ambassadors. Now we're ambassadors because we're new men. We're new creatures. And everything's passed away and everything's new. And he's given us a new ministry. It's called a ministry of reconciliation. And verse 19 says, now here's what it is, that, that God was in Christ and he was reconciling the world to himself. And now he wants you to be the means of that. You, you have a message of reconciliation. Your ministry is to the world. Your message is the love of Jesus Christ. It's for the whole world. And your ambassadors. And an ambassador doesn't stay in their own country. They go to another country. An ambassador is looking for another place to represent the master. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And then he says in verse 20, as though God did beseech you by us. So God is begging you, but he's using me to do it. And so here's what he said. We pray you in Christ's stead, because Jesus isn't here. On his behalf, here's my desire for you, that you would be reconciled to God because he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Hey, listen, he was just saying to Christians, Christian, you know this life is not your home. And you've grown to be on the other side. Not just so that you can cease to live, but that so that you can really live. But you're not there yet. You're here. And you have a job to do. And this life is preparation for the next life because you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you need to understand something. You, you need to understand the plan and purpose of God here. Why are you here? That from henceforth, you're not going to live to yourself, but you're going to live for him who died for you and rose again. <clears throat> and what does that life consist of for you? Well, you're a new man now. And your life is not about yourself. You've been given a new ministry. And no longer are you serving the interests of your flesh. No longer are you serving the desires of this earthly life and all that you can accomplish and achieve here. Your desires have changed and your ministry is to the lost. And so he's given you a message. And the message is the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ is that God would become flesh and die for you. The love of Jesus Christ is that he would not impute guilt to your account but that he would deliver you from that and remember all of that no more. So, we're ambassadors. What are we doing to be ambassadors? The message for us today is we're just a month and a bit past our missions conference. We're just a few weeks past our church anniversary and outreach. 
And all of the effort and energy that went in, and it was such a blessing on that day, but where has that effort and energy gone? Where is the desire? Was the desire just so we had a big day that we could glory in, or was our desire to genuinely see the lost converted to Jesus Christ? We look at our life now, and we realize that from henceforth, we're not to live unto ourselves. Well, what are we living for? Are we pursuing the lost? Do we have a concern for the lost? Do we think of the lost? Do we minister to the lost around us? May God help us today to be ambassadors the way he has designed us to be for his glory. Now, Lord, help us, we pray this morning. Even in the stillness, as we close this meeting off, we're reminded of uh, the weight of responsibility that we have. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take that responsibility seriously today, that we would be concerned for the lost. You said that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And now you've given us that same ministry. And I pray that each of us would take it seriously as believers today. That we wouldn't just get up and go about our Monday. And then show up here next Sunday and nothing changed. And we never sought to share the truth of Christ. We never had the courage to stand and speak. We never handed out a gospel leaflet. We, we never spoke into the life of somebody out of concern for their soul. Let, let it not be said that was us, but help us to care for the lost. You've placed us in this world. You have not yet removed us from this world, and you've given us some ministry to this world. I pray, Lord, that we'd all take it seriously as we think about our Christian life and how we're living it. With our heads bowed this morning, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Are you here today without Christ as your Savior? Are you here today and you'd say, Pastor, I don't know if I died that I'd go to heaven. I don't know that my sin has been forgiven and I'd like to know. Would there be anybody here? You'd just raise up your hand and say, Preacher, that's me. There's nobody looking around, but I'd like to know so that I can pray for you this morning. Anybody? I would like to be saved, forgiven of my sin. I'd, I'd like to know what it is to be born again. Then how about you today, Christian? How are you doing as an ambassador for Jesus Christ? I'm not sure what the Lord is doing in your heart and life this morning, but I, I believe that each of us could do a little more, could care a little more, could be concerned more for the lost around us. Oh, may we take our responsibility seriously to share the love of Christ with a fallen world. Let's take a minute as the piano begins to play. Would you just pray? Whatever the Lord is dealing with your heart about.